for a person like me, for an exile like me, there is this attachment to the past. That past includes your land, your people, your culture, your language, everything. And when you know that you cannot go back for sure, for 100%, there is this dream. You go back in your dream. I have this dream over and over. I go to a cemetery where my mother, my grandmother, grandparents, and ancestral relatives were buried. I would, I would walk in. It's a long walk, very long. And I would spot different tombs of people I knew. And I would try to find their tombs. I would ask myself, it's why I couldn't find. And I would realize, oh, I was away when they were buried. And I would look for someone to show me their places and couldn't find. And I wake up. As a little child, I was taught by my grandmother is that the only best thing that you can actually do to your loved ones who have passed away is to pray for them. When I pray, I, I use that hat that was hand woven by my grandmother. In Urumqi, if I wear it every day, it is a sign of separatism because I'm showing myself as a separate person from the Chinese diaspora. Allah, Akbar, Allah, Akbar. Your national identity is a sign of separatism and your set of belief system is a sign of extremism. If, if they find one prayer rug, you're doomed. I work as a journalist at Voice of America. I have been using a pen name, a pseudonym, as Asim Kashgarian. I was in a safe country in the U.S. I didn't fear that I would get easily hurt by using my real name, but I was more afraid that my family and friends and, and extended relatives back home would be um, targeted if I opened up, if I used my real name. I have been living under that fear for as long as I would say for at least two decades. When I was living in China, I didn't speak out against the government because I wanted to protect myself and my family. When I left China, I continued that. I tried to keep silent, um, still fearing. D did it help, like being silent, be like using a um, fake name? <laughs> I've seen friends, personal mentors, teachers, and some relatives being targeted. They had been interned, imprisoned, killed up until today. It was a summer party for employees. There's this music, laughter, and we had a lot of fun. And in, in this picture, the only person who's actually not in prison is me and the rest they're incarcerated that photo is a reminder for me um, that my friends and colleagues are actually suffering there are about 11 million Uyghurs living in China and it seems that evidence suggests that, you know, at least one in 10 
Uyghurs has been detained or arrested. The Chinese government has often targeted Uyghurs as a security concern. If you practice religion in a way that the Chinese government sees as not acceptable, you're an extremist, but that means you're also a separatist and you're also a terrorist. The region really was first kind of incorporated into a state based in China with the Qing Empire's conquest of the region in the 1750s. And when the Qing Empire came back to the region in the 1880s, it was incorporated as a province. It was given the name Xinjiang, which means new territory or new frontier. We always prefer to call our homeland as East Turkestan, not Xinjiang. The, the Chinese government is not just a repressing or putting Uyghurs by million in the concentration camp in East Turkestan. They're also repressing Uyghurs outside of China too. Because the Chinese government doesn't want the world to know what's happening. Every Uyghur has connection to that genocide and that repression. This is a land of harmony and stability, where people from various ethnic backgrounds live and work in peace and contentment. I remember sitting in horse carts with my grandmother. She would say, oh, you, you, you don't see my child. You are born at the best of times. When I was born in 1979, China began reform, and actually it was a very short-lived renaissance for the Uyghur life. The Uyghur language was kind of given some kind of autonomy until 1989. The Tiananmen Square protests and the subsequent crackdown, uh, you had general kind of backsliding on the allowing of political space, open freedom in any way. But in the Uyghur region, this was amplified by the fall of the Soviet Union. In the Uyghur regions, public protest was immediately identified as nationalism or extremism. You have the Al-Qaeda attacks on the U.S. September 11, 2001. Essentially, the Chinese government, they begin trying to link Uyghurs to international Islamic terrorism. Next up, we have Kasim Abdurahim from Xinjiang University. In early 2000s, I was a university student. I attended regional and national English speaking competitions. Live and learn is the motto I have adopted. I believe within education I will succeed and help others succeed. After I graduated from university, I started the language training school. And it was unique because it was the only um, government sanctioned Uyghur owned private language school in the capital city of Arunchi. I was considered to be an educator, an influencer, and person of pride among the Uyghurs. Some friends that I knew told me their stories of interrogation, uh, even before I was interrogated. So I was aware of such things that were going on. It was very stressful because you don't know if they would let you go or if they would take you to detention facilities. Amidst the kind of the rep repression that um, followed the Olympics in the Uyghur region, 
we have uh, an incident that takes place in a factory in southern China um, where several Uyghur workers are killed by Han workers. And there's uh, three days of chaotic violence in the city. When the protest started in the evening, I was with my um, at least like five or six core staff and we were going out to dinner. I saw Chinese women with two little kids uh, coming at us. She asked to use one of our phones. I saw that she was very, very afraid and I asked them if they wanted to stay in our school. On July 9th, during lunchtime, uh, seven Chinese police with plain clothes, but with um, weapons, um, came to my office. I thought that they were finally given a, an excuse to arrest me. At the end of the interrogation, the, the highest ranking police official would come in and sit in front of me and he would lecture me and then he would in between thank me for doing what I did helping that Chinese woman and kids when they returned me home there were this three police officers and one of them said like I, I, I can't figure this out why we're sending you home you would be disappeared today. That was the plan. The riots that took place in July 2009 in Urumqi are a real watershed in the situation of Uyghurs inside China. Because not only did it create an even stronger feeling in the state that Uyghurs presented a threat to stability, it created um, a lot of fear among Han Chinese. The, the Chinese government started to arrest more people and surveil, surveillance uh, uh, increased uh, day by day, week by week. So you have first these mass internment camps and we start seeing the disappearance in mass of large swaths of the Uyghur population. What we have seen is something on a scale that hadn't been seen before. China Cables is both a project and a, a set of documents. The documents came to us through a line of uh, Uyghurs out of Xinjiang uh, several years ago. Around that, we built up an international journalism project. The most surprising thing about the whole documents set is that it's them, Chinese officials, openly admitting what they're doing. So the Chinese government's public position on the camps is that they are humane and they're educational. And they're designed part of a security apparatus to stop terrorism in the region. In Xinjiang Jiaopei Zhongxin is a school. All students are free to eat. We have spoken to many of them. They have said, and this is the most chilling thing of all, they have said, we have been tortured, we have been electrocuted, we have been raped, uh, about reprogramming us, they're about killing our culture. There's equally no argument over the fact that the violence in that region was awful uh, in, in, in a short period of time. But what you're seeing is a response that is so out of kilter with the size of the violence. In recent years, by holding high the banner of socialist rule of law, a legitimate struggle against terrorism and extremism has been waged in Xinjiang. The tendency of frequent terrorist activities has been effectively curbed. A few weeks before I went to Beijing, I 
sat down with a high-ranking um, Chinese official who told me that he was very happy to finally to see that bad Uyghurs be arrested and good ones like me be promoted. You're telling me that I'm the good Uyghur and you're happy that the bad ones are being rounded up, but those bad ones are exactly the same as me. So he was actually helping me to rethink my decisions in life. Should I keep suppressing and living here while so much is happening? Like people are being arbitrarily detained and I myself being constantly interrogated. And I'm also like seeing no guarantee for my safety. I was so-called chosen to be a representative of a Uyghur so-called minority in the national youth model selection. When I was shaking hands with Liu Anchao, then the vice president of China, I knew that I was leaving the country in the same month. I didn't want to leave my home country, whatever happens. That's, that was how I, how I grew up, but I didn't keep that promise. I told my wife from the beginning that we would go to Dubai for a week travel. I told her that we were not returning while we were actually on our flight. From May to October in 2017, we went to Dubai and then Turkey, and then finally we were able to come to the U.S. And I took a deep breath. I felt the breath, yes. And I looked at my wife and daughter. They were with me, and I was like, oh, finally free. I had to start all over again, and I didn't have any future, no social connections, no friends, no relatives, nothing. I told everyone back home that I was in New York pursuing an education in culinary arts. And all of a sudden, Education Bureau of Urumqi issued a notice telling me that if the legal representative of the school won't present himself in a matter of a few weeks, then we will cancel the school license. If I went back to China, I knew that I would be arrested. I was hoping to actually get some money while studying here from the school in Urumqi. I wouldn't be able to pay the tuition and I wouldn't even be able to survive in New York. It was cheaper uh, living around Washington DC than New York. Plus, there is the largest Uyghur community in that area. So that kind of comforted us. And you have a whole community of people or a whole society who are sharing traumatic experiences, you've got several complex layers. When we talk about collective trauma, we're talking both about the shared experiences of individuals, each of whom has been overwhelmed at one time or another by a sense of fear or threat or terror to themselves or people they care about. So there's collective trauma, there's collective resilience, there's collective healing. For the past five years, I've suppressed it so much. You really have to work very hard to actually balance through exercise. If I stop exercising or running, I know that I would be lost sometimes, like mentally. Sometimes you just lie in your bed, but you can't just get up. You, you, you ask yourself, what, what is this? Oh, that's fear. 
As long as I can remember, I was very little. I was at my grandparents' house most of the time. She passed away in 2019, in February. And I was in the US. When my grandmother was dying, there was one word that she uttered very clearly. And that was, and that was my, my name. I know if I stayed there, um, my grandmother wouldn't even be able to know that I was alive. I would be in probably in one of those prisons. My beat at VOA is news about Uyghurs and other ethnic minorities in China. Every time I, I cover news, um, do interviews, and uh, read reports about the repression against the Uyghurs, it's always, like to me, it's always reliving uh, the trauma that I have uh, lived. At the end, I would feel um, joy and comfort in doing this because I know that uh, I am making some impact in letting the world know what is happening. I don't feel safe every day or any day because my closest relatives and friends and past colleagues, they are actually indirectly harassed. Chinese uh, secret police actually asked one of my friends to contact me and they said to my friend that they already know that I work for Voice of America and they were interested in becoming my friends, quote unquote, and then I, I refused. In America, you don't worry about police while you're walking in the street. You don't worry about police coming at you and checking your phone and, and looking for uh, apps. Anger doesn't solve a problem. Revenge doesn't solve a problem. And I have to set the right example, at least for my children. They should be able to learn stuff that has happened to their parents. Martin Luther King Jr. here gave his famous speech, I have a dream. I have actually a dream that I have to fight for the freedom, for justice and for everything that is uttered in Martin Luther King's speech. That equality, justice and freedom is what everyone is entitled. In the U.S. after I have been uh, granted asylum, I had the freedom to actually choose and use my real name. My name is Qasim Abdurrahim Kashgar.